Okay, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll do a, a short little introduction. Chris Rose, I met him through Michael uh, Benson as a as someone who was, uh, they did the introductory um, book launch at MIT of Space Odyssey. Together they spoke about this and uh, that was right before I was meant to go meet the Queen of England. So I um, found uh, Chris was the only British person in the room. So I had to ask him about the uh, protocols and what am I supposed to do yeah. when I'm the monarch and all that. And he was very helpful with uh, getting me together, even though I um, actually did my undergraduate in Imperial College. So um, and which, uh, Imperial College, it was in fact uh, the sort of the protectorate of the queen herself. Now, uh, uh, Chris and I have been working for several years now, uh, starting from the standpoint of what are emotions for? And um, this again happened as a question in a, in a Molecular Frontiers forum that I was running at MIT, including the Molecular Frontiers Inquiry Prize, which is a Nobel Prize for children. Uh, it is awarded in Sweden at the same place where the real Nobels for the adults are awarded, and it's awarded for questions. We only came up with this idea in 2008, and I was the co-founder, the director of it for the first decade or so. And, um, and it's crazy to me that we never thought of rewarding questions before. Uh, humanity has always, as far as we know, there's no record of any other prize ever being created for questions, good questions. Good questions are what drive science, and uh, good questions is what Chris and I connect on very well. And uh, the idea thon is going to be, it's his uh, uh, brainchild and uh, him and Carolina Sulich, who is, should also activate herself here, uh, as well as Nikhil Lal, who is coming here too. And he's, uh, he's been minding the, the, the Q&A and he's one of the co-organizers. They have been working with the universities and, um, school, and, and um, students from four continents over the last, uh, I would say, several months, maybe three or four months. So it's been eight months in the making this conference, but during the last couple of months, it really heated up. And they've come up with this idea of the idea thon. So uh, we tried many different ways of doing it, but um, I'm going to let them explain what they expect of the people. And then if you go to uh, osmocosm.org, uh, there is a, up to the top right, there is a place that's uh, it's called Osmoscapes. And then there's content there that is just fantastic. And I, I truly love the, the, the stuff that the Zoe and others did. So many wonderful imageries um, of uh, cartoons. Uh, fake news from the future, where uh, we've imagined what is it like, what would it be like once these um, uh, smell phones and scent devices are part of the Internet of Things, and everybody has one. What are the goods and the the ups and downs? There is even, even some kind of smell terrorism going around uh, in the future. So um, it would be just so fantastic to 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 see this uh, idea on in action. So I will let the, this team take it over. Chris leads the team. Carolina. Thanks. Nikhil are assisting and I'm going to jump off. I'm still here, but I will not be visible. <laughs> One thing Andreas forgot to mention was that um, I, I arrived at the conference at MIT and uh, he mentioned to me about the Queen and within about two seconds he said, what's in motion for? And then he walked off. So um, that was my introduction and I've been thinking about that question ever since. Um, anyway, come back. Hold on, hold on. I forgot to also mention something else. Chris also has a book. I have it up here. It's called Light and Materiality. And uh, uh, Chris and Michael are friends, but they're the exact opposite when it comes to books. Uh, Chris's uh, books are very light, thin, very few words, lots of images. Uh, Michael's books are thick and uh, full of images. But uh, yeah, the, the, the difference is in the thickness. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, I'd like to introduce Carolina, who you've already seen some of you, and Nikhil who um, between the three of us, we're uh, going to be responsible for the idea thon. Um, our first idea for introducing it and getting it going is that um, we want to find out what you're particularly interested in. There's a lot of diversity in the audience. Um, we don't want to uh, assume that um, your questions or your interests uh, at this stage fall into uh, given defined categories, they might well do. Uh, Nikhil has already helpfully suggested some, which I'll let him talk about. Um, and Carolina too, if the, the three of us have very different views, um, different interests and different ways of working. And so what we were planning to do at this stage is just to talk for about say five minutes, five or 10 minutes each about what those interests um, and directions are for us personally. And when we've done that, um, we can 
uh, we can leave you to think about that and write some things down either in the chat or on pieces of paper or whatever's to hand. And um, we'll work out a way. We'll have a second idea on session this afternoon. Uh, when we come to that, we'll start working on a way of uh, bringing those groups together. So in other words, we have very, we have several different directions or interest groups in this conference. So uh, I'll hand over to Carolina um, to say something to start with. I think she is frozen. Uh, I don't think she hears you and she's on mute. Yeah, okay, we'll go to Nikhil. Hi, yeah, so um, as Chris mentioned, I'm Nick, I, or Nikhil. I am an engineer by trade, but um, as the website suggests, I'm also an olfaction enthusiast, and I hope one day all of you will be too, if you aren't already. Um, the purpose of the Ideathon is to give this uh, voice to a conference that I think is so often uh, not heard, and that is the voice of the audience. And we don't even think of you as audience, we think of you as active participants in this conference. And so Chris mentioned we have kind of a few rough categories we, we have in mind here. We have something like data, hardware, applications, ethics and law. Um, and some of these have already been touched on. Uh, fundamentally though, the objective of this conference is to be something of a catalyst. As Agamem Agamemnon launched over a thousand ships in pursuit of Helen, we too would like to launch, if not a thousand companies, at least a thousand different entities or groups, people who want to move this field forward um, so that the next time we have a pandemic, we aren't stuck at home for a year to two years at hand. Uh, next time we have a pandemic, it stopped on day one. And so what we're asking largely is, can you, can you help us with this? Um, and so if you could put uh, uh, questions you might have in the chat, if you, would like, uh, you can make, generate some uh, representations of your ideas in the form of art, sketches. Some of you have already been working in teams perhaps up into the, up into the Ideathon, some of the students in this conversation. And for uh, those of you, thank you so much. Uh, we were taking a look at your work last night and all of us were entirely like blown away. And I just wanted to quickly spotlight um, some of that work here. Um, so this is, this is up on our website now. Um, and here are some of the selected works that were submitted. Uh, and they're, they're all fantastic. It's not so much just what can we do with the technology? It, I mean, there are many uses like Tristan was talking about from our, our bell just now, but the, the, like, what, like how can we be thinking about the world differently through the lens of someone who might smell? Because it's so hard for us to maybe empathize with the animals around us that many of which just use smell as a default form of communication. Um, so we ask for your help here. And uh, from my side, I'll be most helpful probably with hardware. And so any of you who might have questions, uh, feel free to follow me here in the chat or afterwards. And I'm happy to discuss a bit from an engineering perspective how we can make olfaction tech a reality. Um, so j just to get the ball rolling, does anyone have anything they'd like to, to ask about or ideas they might have in this field? Well, if not, I, I think, oh. well, I, one of the things with the idea that I presented, what I think is also interesting is there's so much uh, work about uh, the sensing, right? But the, the recreation of scent, like telescent and telepresence, like that type of technology, like do, are, do we really need a library of volatiles to recreate sense dynamically? Um, I think that uh, part of the uh, problem of being isolated during COVID is people think that it's just about like videos, but like Clubhouse was, people felt so much presence just because the voice was ambient in the room. So how do we, uh, what part of olfaction is part of recreating these ambient experiences, right? And transmitting information that might be overlooked. And uh, so uh, there's a very uh, heavy focus here on the sensing part, right? And the analysis. But uh, I know there are people working on recreating scents. You know, um, I was at the Museum of Perfume in Paris and they had these little electronic things, but also uh, creating synesthesia through electronic stimulation. Um, I mean, these are all things that I think are really interesting and that would really uh, make it a more of a holistic experience, not just the sensing part, but also the uh, recreation of scents without having to have volatile chemicals uh, handy. 
Okay. Um, Carolina, do you want to say something? Uh, yes, I just want to really encourage all of you to participate. And this web page that you see, uh, we would like to populate uh, it with your uh, works. It might be sketch, it might be whatever you have in mind. We have like amazing few schools that are participating, like from Sydney, as Chris mentioned, but also like from Warsaw, Poland School of Form with Paulina Grabowska as a instructor. Uh, and they have been working slightly before the conference, but we uh, uh, assume, and I know about some of the students in the audience that are participating, that they have uh, their visions or they're already working in olfaction. Um, so we are here to talk with you and also like all of the people who are panelists, uh, we can try to somehow arrange uh, like or pass the questions or meet you up with them if you have any particular problem that you think like uh, one of our speakers could address. Uh, Okay. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, in, in the context of this conference, um, I, I'm something of an outlier in that my career started with um, uh, furniture making out of wood, uh, which became my favourite material to work with. And then it progressed to design in a bigger sense, uh, strategic design and uh, all sorts of things there. And then it progressed from uh, studying design in relation to nature. So um, the, uh, the relationship between formal morphology and function and evolution and how things like adaptation took place, how a basic model was so many times adapted into different principles. Um, and then I went on from there to start doing more science art collaboration. Now, the thing is, the reason I mentioned that is because some of you are evidently, uh, at this stage, um, evidently interested in engineering and technology and uh, volatile organic compounds and sensing apparatus and that kind of thing. Um, but, uh, you know, as an, a purely by chance, um, this book arrived today, uh, 13 Ways of Smelling a Tree, okay? which is um, obviously based, the title is based on Wallace Stevens' work, uh, 13 Ways of Seeing a Blackbird. And that relates back to that question about language, that unless you expand uh, the language that you're familiar with and um, take it into other dimensions, which that work does, 13 Ways of um, Seeing a Blackbird, um, I think you can't be freed up from the things you assume and the things you assume, uh, you take them for granted as though you're not aware of them. And one of the great advantages of this conference is uh, bringing together so many different people and disciplines um, uh, with a linking factor. Uh, it's, a, it's a linking factor that has many different dimensions to it. Um, two other things I'll say about this book very quickly is that um, it uses very similar um, illustrations to what we used on our website, um, wispy things. And I'll just say uh, very quickly, this is a, a key phrase, I think, that it says, aroma is the primary language of trees. They talk with molecules, conspiring with one another, beckoning fungi, um, scolding insects and whispering to microbes. So I think, you know, the role of writing and the role of ideas, it can be expressed in so many ways. Anyway, if, uh, if you want to think about different attitudes, open-ended questions, there may be things that are not specified here. Um, there tends to be, you know, there is a domination in science of convergent processes. So in art and design, we use um, divergent and convergent things. Obviously, I think that the combination of those leads to some rich insights. And we would invite you to um, spend some time taking some notes for yourself or uh, putting questions in the chat. 
or uh, as uh, Carolina said, you know, using ways to communicate with other people, other individuals. Um, and we will, uh, for the session two, which we'll have later on, um, uh, we will have a format for that when we've got something to go on. So uh, do put your questions in the chat um, and we'll give you about 20 minutes to do that. Uh, to think about everything that's happened so far. I think because I think it's essential that you have some time to reflect on the, ev the amazing range of stuff we've, ha we've heard of since the beginning. Okay, is that all right with everyone? That was clear to me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good idea. We can put okay. some meditative music on to like... Yeah. Thoughts yeah. appear. Perhaps we could um, we play a couple of those videos for a while uh, for ten minutes. Say. Sure. There's a good one that I will uh, put uh, the URL on now. It's really wonderful. Again, it is the BBC created it. Uh, uh, yeah. It goes on for fifteen minutes and. Uh, Wow, what what? It, just listen to what they the people say. This uh, uh, prior minister of health is talking. Uh, Matt, I'm putting it in the chat. Please play this as soon as I'm done talking for 15 minutes. As people are thinking, they can have this in the background. Um, uh, notice the question that he asks of uh, the the previous health minister asks the current health minister. If this technology was not packaged inside of a dog and it was instead of a, a laboratory a sensor. Would you take it more seriously? And that's a, that. It's the key. It's a, that's the rub that we're still thinking of the dog's nose as something magical that is packaged in a furry bag of legs and slobber and nail <laughs> and teeth and all. Uh, but in fact, it's it's just like a bird. Uh, if you see the bird flying, then you know then you know that heavier than air flight is possible. If you see the dog sniffing, then you know that this is possible. And in fact, the dog's nose isn't even the nose. It's up here. It's small. So uh, everything works. Uh, the same in nature. If you if you can see the dog doing it, you should expect this to be able to be done technologically. Okay. Okay. I think I uh, put the yeah. My name is Ian Duncan Smith. I'm the member of parliament for Chingford Wilford Green. Relax. I used to be a member of the cabinet, but I'm not here to talk about politics. I'm here to talk about something much much more interesting. <laughs> In this film, I want to tell you about something extraordinary, about pioneering research with the potential to change how we diagnose cancer and how people living with serious illness can be helped to manage their conditions with the help of this lot and their absolutely remarkable sense of smell. Dogs like these are capable of detecting the tiniest of odour concentrations. I mean, up to one part per trillion, maybe even more. What does that actually mean? Well, imagine one teaspoonful of sugar dissolved not just in one Olympic-sized swimming pool, but in two Olympic-sized swimming pools, and the dogs can detect that. That means that once properly trained, they are able to detect odors associated with disease in human beings. In other words, these dogs are capable of literally sniffing out disease. Experts agree that early detection is the most important factor in surviving cancer, and the research that's being conducted here offers an opportunity for us to drastically improve the early detection of the disease. In this test, a specially trained cancer detection dog is told to circle a carousel holding eight evenly spaced urine samples. One is from a patient with prostate cancer, and the other seven are from healthy individuals. Indication four. Remarkably, the dog is able to detect the sample from the cancer patient. Here we come. Well, that was absolutely amazing. I mean, I have never seen anything like that. How do you actually get the dogs to, 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 to do all that, to train, to make sure they check the right samples? How did that all come about? Well, all of our work is based in positive reinforcement. So what that means is the dog wants to come in here and actually search these samples to get paid for it. He understands that the particular smell, this volatile signature of, of prostate cancer that you've seen, quite a unique smell, 
actually means reward to him, so he gets a sound for it and the dog gets food. Is there a level of reliability? Is there a certain number or a certain percentage of times that if a dog isn't indicating or getting it right, you should say, do you know what, I can't use that dog? Well, what is that? What is that line? Well, when we're looking at the development of the dog, we're looking really reliability of 85, 90%. We might need to make sure the dog is operating at that level. Indication six. I heard these remarkable stories, stories of... As chief executive of the charity Medical Protection Dogs, Dr Clare is a lean figure in driving this research forward. In fact, her interest in this area began after she was alerted by her own dog to a potentially life-threatening condition. One of my dogs, Daisy, she's a bladder cancer detection dog, she started to behave a little bit differently around me. She started to sort of give, give me a worried look and then she started nodding at my chest. Uh, it led me to investigate. I found a, a, a lump. I went to um, the doctors and was referred. And to cut a long story short, I was diagnosed with a very early stage and grade breast cancer. I was fascinated by Claire's story, but I wanted to be absolutely sure that the research being undertaken by Claire's team was meeting the highest scientific standards. How reliable do you think the sciences are? How how robust are you? So this is really, really rigorous work. We don't know exactly what it is the dogs use to make the, the identification that cancer's there, but we know it's a volatile, we know it's a, we know it's a smell. In fact, studies recently published in France, Italy and elsewhere have confirmed the extraordinary potential of dogs to assist with the diagnosis of disease in human beings and Claire's team is working on one of the largest studies to date. We're doing an incredibly robust clinical trial. We've got 3,000 patients going to be involved in this next trial detecting prostate cancer from, from urine. Over the next few years, we'll find out the results and the ability of the dog to do this over this large sample patient size. So what do you say to those clinicians that uh, I've heard before who say, oh, well, you know, the thing is, that's all very nice and all very well, but we can't have dogs running around in GP surgeries, you know, just sniffing everybody. That's ludicrous. And the other thing they say is, this is a matter of life and death. You know, you can't have dogs involved in life and death. It's far too serious for that. But how do you, how do you get through that kind of barrier uh, in a sense of kind of prejudice? How do, you, how do you get through that and show them that this is pure science? Well, there's, there's a number of ways, in fact. Firstly, the dog doesn't have to be in the hospital sniffing yeah. around the patient. The samples come to the dogs in the training facility. Yeah. Dogs give their answer. The result goes back to the clinician. The second thing is that although the dog has a fluffy coat and a waggy tail, he is in fact a highly sophisticated biosensor. You know, evolution has given him this highly sensitive nose, yep. go down to parts per trillion. So we're not we're talking about a science here, we're not talking yep. about just sort of fluffy dogs. The other thing is that I'd say to you yes. as well, you know, you rely on dogs every day when you go into the House of Commons. You rely on the you dogs do. to to ensure your safety. People board planes every day that have been screened by, by, by detector dogs to see if they're explosives on board. That's a life and death de yeah. decision. Why do we rely on them there and yet not in assisting us with help? So how much support has the government been giving you? Where do you think the future lies in that? To date, we have no support from the government. And you think this could literally save lives? Absolutely. I know, I know this save, can save lives. It saved my life. That's inspired me to keep going. But also, I'm a scientist. I love the science behind this. We're talking about a highly robust study. We're looking at an ability of a biosensor to detect uh, a biomarker for a disease. The biosensor is a dog, but that doesn't make any difference. Like Claire, my interest in this research is more than academic. It's personal. The doctor thought I'd, uh, the lump had been there um, for about 18 months. My wife, Betsy, um, has had breast cancer. In many respects, I was lucky. My children, my youngest was 16. But I, when I was so ill, I remember thinking, how would I have managed when my, if my children had been, if it had been 10 years earlier and my children were, were little? I mean, I was completely written off. I was very, very ill, as you remember. Mm -hmm. I couldn't look after myself. I couldn't do anything for myself. Um, and the sooner you can detect cancer, the better. The sooner you can detect all diseases, yeah. the better. But this remarkable ability has implications for more than just the detection of cancer. Dogs can also be trained to alert patients with conditions such as type 1 diabetes to a minute shift in their blood sugar levels, which might, in extreme cases, signal the onset of a coma. The dogs are able to detect when a patient might be in danger and fetch any vital medical supplies. Oh yes, he's got it now. He's going round his man. I went to visit Steve and Molly, 
Steve was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in 2006. It's no exaggeration to say that having Molly at his side has been life-changing for Steve and his family. Oh. <laughs> Gracious me. What was life like for both of you before Molly arrived? Where were the big problems? Where, how difficult was all of this? Well, when Stephen was little, yeah. we'd have him just running around and then falling over. Um, you know, we'd be sort of scooping him up and putting him on the sofa mm. and trying to get things into him. I'd gone in in the night and he'd had seizures, so we were testing every hour and a half to two hours all night, every single night. So you were getting up through the night regularly? Setting just alarms. To yeah. And we did that until Molly came along and suddenly when we realised we could trust her, that's when we stopped and now I only get up when she alerts, I get up to her alerts. And she sits. comes and sits at football, doesn't she? And she alerts from the sidelines oh, of the football pitch, whereas I used to have to call Stephen off and keep testing him. And sometimes he'd, he'd gone so low, he was tripping over the ball, so he'd have to have some glucose and then sit out for 20 minutes. So she minutes. will know in an open football pitch. Yeah. Uh, and she will alert, and you will know that she is alerting that your son, who's busy just about to score a goal, has to come off the pitch to get himself sorted out. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, and she's That's actually quite got remarkable, isn't she's it? got permission from all the club referees to let loose onto the pitch with her coat on, isn't she? Really? But so basically, Molly is capable of detecting at any stage out in the fields, out in the garden, on the playing pitch. If you're upstairs and she's downstairs, she'll get as agitated down here as she would upstairs, yeah. is that right? Yeah, she knows. Claire is also a type 1 diabetic, and she's also a beneficiary of her dog's ability to detect shifts in blood glucose levels that might indicate she's in danger. In the three and a half years that we've been together, he has alerted and potentially saved my life over three and a half thousand times. And he does it all for a dog biscuit. Oh, yes. And often leaves me still quite emotional now after all this time because I know without him, I wouldn't be alive today. I actually work as a children's diabetes nurse. So my job is to help care, support, and educate children and families that have got type 1 diabetes. So having magic means I can basically carry on my job here. Without him, I would be testing my blood glucose level every 20 or 30 minutes to try and preempt what was going to happen. With magic, I don't have to do that, which means I can carry on doing my job. But it also means that I'm actually being safe with patients and I'm not likely to collapse you know, when I'm in the middle of a consultation with them, which is not only embarrassing for me, but actually it's giving the wrong message to the patients that you can still live life to the full, even though you've got diabetes. What are you doing? So this is Magic telling me he wants, to do, um, wants me to do a blood glucose test. So I'll ask Magic to fetch my kit. Fetch kit. Good boy. And then I'll check my blood sugar to see actually what is going on. And the blood glucose is five and a half, so his target is 4.7. So he's telling me that in the next 20, 30 minutes, he thinks my blood glucose level is going to be too low. Magic sleeps by my bed, um, so he's always close by me, although actually he can detect a change in my blood glucose level even when I'm upstairs and he's downstairs. But he sleeps by my bed, and what will happen is he will wake up overnight and, and tell me to test. Before I got magic, I would be up every hour, uh, day and night, trying to check my blood glucose level and to try and preempt when these episodes would happen. That meant that I was exhausted. Um, many a time I would be too afraid to go to sleep in case I had an episode and wouldn't wake up from them. Other times I'd be too exhausted. I didn't care if I was going to die overnight. I, was, I just wanted to you know, close my eyes and get some sleep. So what magic has allowed me to do is I can go to bed and not be afraid that I'm never going to wake up in the morning. I'm going to go to bed and my husband doesn't have to worry that when he wakes up in the morning, I'm not going to be dead next to him. And, it, you know, simple things like that, you know, is very difficult to put into words, but that's exactly what having magic means, is that I can have an ordinary life, do ordinary things, and I've got an amazing companion that's going to follow me all the way through it. I've been so impressed by the progress that's been made in this field that I wanted to find out why its potential hasn't been properly recognised and why it isn't receiving the funding it deserves. I went to see my old colleague, the Health Secretary for England, Jeremy Hunt. I started by asking why it was that the health service hasn't so far got behind this incredibly promising work. 
I think probably um, ideas like this uh, sometimes don't get looked at as quickly as they should because they get put in the quackery box when actually what we're doing now, what you're doing, is saying, well, let's look at the science. Let's actually see whether these new ways of doing things are scientifically valid. And sometimes when you do that, you get a surprise. I mean, from, literally from 2004, this work has been peer-reviewed and been available and published. And actually, a lot of doctors involved in cancer treatment have been absolutely certain there is something really rather unique and special about what's been going on. It's been the devil's own business to get uh, medical professionals on a wider scale to say, let's have a look at this. Do you think this says something about the resistance to uh, investment in innovation at times that comes from the medical profession in the NHS? Well, I wouldn't characterise the NHS as not being innovative, but sometimes nonetheless, when you have something that is so unorthodox as this, I mean, you know, I could imagine that lots of doctors' heart will miss a beat at the thought of using a dog to help you detect cancer. Um, but then, as doctors and scientists, uh, they need to look at the evidence. So instead of it being dogs, I was able to say to you or to any from the medical profession, what we have here is a laboratory that detects cancer earlier and more accurately than any of the existing medical tests. What do you think would be the natural reaction to that without the word dogs in it? Well, of course, um, it's the dog spits that I think, as I say, probably causes one or two people's um, heart rates to miss a beat or two. Um, but Ian, I will personally look at the results of this research when it comes through. One of our jobs as MPs is sometimes to question orthodoxies and look at uh, different ways of doing things that possibly the establishment has, has uh, swept under the carpet or not wanted to look at. So if this research is good, then I want to know about it, and I will certainly look at it carefully. The work of our pioneering researchers in this field doesn't just have the potential to save lives, but also to save our NHS many millions of pounds if it's properly funded. We need to recognise that we can still reimagine our centuries-old relationship with dogs and find new ways to make use of their absolutely extraordinary abilities. Yeah, he's a good boy. Come on, then. Let's go. Um, there's an interesting question in the chat um, from Julia. Uh, <clears throat> are you considering using this technology for research processes to collect scent data from the environment and other species to research what they might be communicating with these senses? That's quite an interesting, that's a different <laughs> slant on what we've been focusing on, isn't it? You know, that's a great question. I think there has been quite a bit of work in this in the field of um, entomology, uh, which is kind of the study of insects. And um, one thing I think is interesting that we observed uh, that we have tried to replicate this for is around fire ant communication. So um, of the different ant species, they, they tend to actually be quite different. I mean, they look the same to us maybe, but their kind of methods of interaction uh, can be quite similar. And so one method though is this notion of leaving small pheromone traces as instructions uh, for the future. So that uh, smell isn't just about a immediate detection, it's about a detection tool used to uh, convey messages across time, where today we might leave a note as a human, but animals might leave a note as a, a small scent of themselves or a different scent they might emit. And so ants have been extensively studied using this tech to uh, kind of understand that how does the ant world work? D does the queen actually create like a hive where it provides instructions or is it more discontinuous? And the answer is it depends on the species. So fire ants, for example, are, are less hive minded and more, how do I help the person next to me? And so that's why you see fire ants build things like rafts that float down the river or, or, or bridges that go across uh, small uh, branches that are dis discontinuous. Uh, so there has been quite a bit of work in entomology today, uh, and there needs to be a lot more, I think. It'll definitely give us insight into the how animal world uh, kind of functions. Yeah. Great question. I think uh, another dimension is with soldier ants in the jungle um, that uh, appear to be going along uh, purposefully in a track, very organized line, traveling through the jungle. 
and we tend to think of them as having um, a head or a captain or somebody up front who's telling them what to do. And but if we uh, if we observe it from above with a camera, we notice that um, every so often there appear to be uh, miscreant ants who go off at funny angles, uh, random. They go around in a circle sideways uh, for no apparent reason and then come back and join the forward troop. But it turns out that um, if the head of the troop uh, falls down a hole, let's say, and it can't go any further, then uh, one of the sideways movements that has been mapped out temporarily by the other miscreant ants turns out to be a route uh, that they change to and they go along that way. Um, so that must involve pheromones and it must involve a scent trail. And so, uh, the other, sorry, and Carolina? No, no, I didn't want to interrupt you because you have some kind of like a flow. I just wanted to say that when you finish, we can introduce our attendees to two videos that have been already created yeah. for the uh, ideation. And one of the videos is from Charlie Yankin, who probably is not here with us. He is in Australia and it's yeah. super late right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's do that then. Going to join us definitely on Saturday. Um, so maybe we can play this video, Matt, the yeah. second. What is your smell sharing about you? We're not very fluent in the language of smell, but dogs, medical detection dogs are. Their ability to detect like the chemical signature of different diseases is being used to train handheld devices that could read your scent. Imagine what will happen when your phone can smell you. And not just like whether you stink, but actually read into that information about you. You could wake up with a notification saying you have COVID or cancer or worse. Currently, you don't own any of the data you create. So that information could just be sold to the highest bidder, like your insurer or your employer. The responsibility of anyone that's building this has to be to ask that question of how is this gonna be exploited once we put it out into the world? What is your smell, Cher? Yeah, that was... Um just one submission that we got from uh, the various briefings we did to groups of uh, students and schools around the world and we got some really good results um, which are available on the website and we will have some of the presenters here on Saturday. But yeah, um, Matthew's question, Carolina, do you want to talk about that? Um, we were just posing... Uh, he asked a question I'm saying, Hi, um, Mark. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah. introduce yourself. And uh, I, I at the beginning want to how, uh, thank you, Mark, because Mark is helping us with monitoring your chats and um, he's been like super helpful. And yeah, please ask your question. That's good. And thank you. It's still on the audience. We have Fatma Moran, we have Stephanie Brenner, she's, she's going to speak uh, uh, briefly, and we also have Hill Sarazen and Charles McGinley. So, yes, maybe they will also know some the answer to your question. Yeah, no, I, I'm very curious about like visualizing sense. Right, because at least in, in my I, at least in my ideal world, right, with these new wearables and kind of where right, you think the hollow lens, you think kind of these new lenses that are coming out, even AR and XR. Uh, one sec. Um, Mm. 
slow. I think Phil. Okay. Yeah, so basically, no, just around visualizing sense. And if you could possibly, right, tag different molecules that you know, I don't know if you can tag big things like methane or, or maybe you can see these pollution emitters and maybe with AR or XR technology, you can kind of get a escape, right? Like this atmospheric kind of visualization of sense. And since we know a lot of um, wind patterns already, we could possibly utilize this data and see, right? Here's a high concentration of polluters. This is how it's getting to this population of people and possibly this population of people are, are highly susceptible or, or, or are showcasing, right? Cancer or different kind of asthmatic qualities to their, to their body. So I don't know if that's a possibility or, or if somebody's working on that kind of tech of visualizing sense. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can, I, can I chime in with that? This is Mike McGinley at St. Croix Sensory. Uh, I so, want to add spotlight to you if it's possible. It's oh. okay. I think my camera is all on. Um, I'll, I'll just start. I, I think that's that's a. It's going to be an interesting area. I think we've seen a lot in the last few years, maybe five years, of visualizing odor information from a nuisance odor, community odor standpoint. Um, integrating dispersion models to try to get real time information about how the air is moving, and if we have information about sources, how we could be predicting what's going on. And I think I think the links to chemistry become important. And it's the conversation of, are you finding um, tracers? So for example, methane is, is something that might be a tracer for landfill odors. You know, if, if methane is present, then odors should follow. But that doesn't mean if methane's not present, there are no odors. So that's always, you know, that's been seen in wastewater for years at H2S. Everybody wants to talk about hydrogen sulfide, but but that's only that's an important part, but only a part of the story. Um, so so I think those will be interesting things, and I think um, the next advancements I'm excited about. I, I've you know I had some communication in the last couple of years with people who are really doing a lot in data mining, and and you know this AI side of things that you know when I first started hearing about it, I you you know was sort of confused and what is this going to mean, but it keeps coming up and it's become, you know, for me, I see it now, you know, I understand it. And now um, as we do analytical tied to sensory and what that might help to understand and pull together from an AI perspective of which compounds have the most influence um, to, as you're saying, then, you know, to be able to visualize that. And can we look for, do we have to look for everything or can we find you know, specific um, um, characters, so to speak, that that uh, that play the role. We 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 often use an analogy of the entourage. You know, sometimes you have the star odor, and then there's the entourage that follows along. <laughs> you know, in, in which which parts are we able to keep an eye on and know if we see the entourage and the star is somewhere near, <laughs> kind of thing. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Yeah, just like uh, Nick just wrote in a chat, hi all, we just launched a new report to help organize the ID8 and ID8. Feel free to join us here. And there is a link in the chat. So you can follow there if you're not familiar with Mirrorboard. This is like a very easy tool that we can mutually collaborate on gathering together um, different ideas. So you can like write idea or link to your project there and also make an annotation, for example, with who you would like to consult or your question. And we will just like do a very collaborative 
uh, mind map there from sticky notes. I can share. Yeah, like, like, for example, if I can share my screen. Um, yeah, I'm doing that, Chris. Oh, I, right. So we will be. There was also um, an interesting question about the relationship between olfaction and synesthesia, which we'd like to go into. Cool, I just saw an interesting post by someone here, just thinking of the concept of geofencing. Do you, whoever wrote that, would you be able to say a little more? Uh, can you say that word again? Um, okay. uh, just reading out a sticky here, just thinking of the concept of geofencing, could there be similar for scent? Scent beacons, autonomous tech? Um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's... Say, yeah. Hmm. Um, it makes me think about uh, dogs um, that are restrained within an, an unfenced large yard by an electronic sensor that sets off their collar. So they soon learn not to run out into the road. But I think that's just um, a development of what they do with a sense anyway. And if, I don't know, like I cannot see chat right now, but, uh, but if somebody is like writing something in the chat, we can not spotlight this person and just enable the participant to, to be visible and ask the question. That's an interesting question from um, uh, T. Smith. It's, it says, is there a common machine description of organic structure and scent? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And uh, I would love for someone to, to go after it. Uh, we have uh, Stephen Thaler, I think he's in the audience. He will speak tomorrow, I believe, uh, right. on, on some of this. And uh, yeah, to have a machine language description of scent, uh, what we do know is that chemistry isn't going to really work for us here. If you just yeah. show the structures of the molecules, they don't translate really into scent very easily. Structure, function, relations, and scent are not really uh, all that. No. Good. no. Hmm. It can be a kind of analog of it, but it's not the real thing. In general, it will be our board for the rest of the conference. So you can like build your place, mind place there. And 
we have four more minutes of this session and later on we will have lunch which will go for 30 minutes and then we have like an, another session of speakers and i hope and i'm of course i'm not hoping i'm sure that they will bring even more inspiration to your yeah. project and ideas and more questions because this technology is like extremely fascinating and revolutionary and emerging and there is like so much to do and so much space for you to join and build your own projects and designs and it's, it's carolina can i share my screen for a moment i don't know please okay you can. <laughs> Let's, i need to know how to stop share my first just on the share screen. Yeah, I don't see this button. Okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, it's got delayed action. This was my first attempt at modeling the conference. I can see it live on the on the mirror and it's quite remarkable what's going on. Lots, so many people are thinking. Uh, th this is, I think this is an improvement of a, of a regular conference where people are thinking, but you can't see their thoughts. Here you can see their thoughts. It's quite interesting. I think we will have a law section tomorrow. Um, the center of it really from a phenomenology point of view is the experience, which uh, relates to the point Andreas made. What do the smells say to you? Because the smell is something that's constituted of natural materials, but uh, we interact with those and convert them into uh, something else and then experience. And in fact, um, from that point of view, it's virtually, it seems to be virtually impossible to explain whether two people sense the same thing from the same input. But it, that depends on very much on how one is educated. So if people, if uh, say, you know, a group of people are all educated in the same way, then they will probably um, name their experience in a similar way. Yeah, but that, uh, that was just learning about Miro. Anyway, um, I think have we got uh, we've got a link to Miro in the chat or Nicole? Have we? Um... Yep, that's correct. It's in the chat right now. Um... Okay. So it's quite a good way of um, uh, just diagramming ideas and associations between um, you know any any number of people. <laughs> 